Hello, PyroJet community. Uh, this is Michael here on September 17th, 2022, just with another short update. It's been several weeks since I've made any further posts uh, about the status of the project and kind of where we're going with it. Uh, so I just wanted to take a little time to kind of update everybody on where we're at and what we're doing. Maybe show you a little bit of the uh, current setup I've been messing around with um, and how we're getting some of the results, early results, very preliminary results uh, that we're getting by putting aluminum on various substrates. Uh, I think I've got some samples. Uh, yeah, right here. There we go. Yeah, like uh, aluminum metal on quartz uh, and aluminum metal on aluminum nitride, which is kind of interesting. We've also put it on aluminum oxide and several other materials, as well as aluminum metal on aluminum and aluminum metal on steel. So. We're definitely making progress compared to what we were before, um, and the way we're doing that is by moving to a process that has been commonly referred to in the literature called uh, about the status of the project and kind of where we're going with it. Uh, so I just wanted to take a little time to kind of update everybody on where we're at and what we're doing, maybe show you a little bit of the uh, current setup I've been messing around with um, and how we're getting some of the results, early results, very preliminary results uh, that we're getting by putting aluminum on various substrates. Uh, I think I've got some samples actually. Uh, yeah, right here. There we go. Yeah, like uh, aluminum metal on quartz uh, and aluminum metal on aluminum nitride, which is kind of interesting. We've also put it on aluminum oxide and several other materials as well as aluminum metal on aluminum and aluminum metal on steel. So uh, we're definitely making progress compared to what we were before. Um, and the way we're doing that is by moving to a process that has been commonly referred to in the literature called uh, as additive friction, sorry, friction stir additive manufacturing. Uh, I'm going to try and take this all in one take, so it might be a little bit crazy, but the, um, the process essentially uses a rotating tool, like a conventional CNC spindle, with material fed through a central hole or shaft, or sometimes fed in as wire or rod. And what happens, as is very, very briefly, very simply, is that the material is pressed out from the hole or from the rod stock onto a surface, and as it rotates, it heats up. And that increase of internal energy of the material that is in the powder or the rod, um, combined with continuous motion across a surface, is enough to put the material in a very high rate of shear strain, or uh, put, applies a large amount of shear stress to the material. And this results in it uh, becoming essentially viscoplastic, uh, moving into the viscoplastic or the recrystallization regime for the material, and that results in it flowing readily, kind of like a thermoplastic does when it's at a high temperature. It's actually working better. It is actually working better, yeah. at a high temperature. Um, although this process also principally works with plastics and ceramics, uh, currently we're working with metals just because they're the easiest and perhaps the most useful since they're electrically conductive and they're very strong and metal printing at home is pretty uncommon and could be very useful. Um, but essentially what, what we've been working on here is we've moved away from chemical combustion processes uh, like hydrogen and oxygen and gasoline and ethanol and all those things, uh, just because managing the combustion chemistry at small scales is very complicated, um, and it's difficult to get a read on all those things. Uh, and perhaps most importantly is that most of the fuel stocks we were using, well, if they're already a liquid, uh, when they convert to a vapor, they have a large volume expansion, which excludes oxygen from a combustion chamber we're setting up, which tends to limit the maximum energy density you can get out of a micro combustor or small combustion engine type setup, like what we were doing with our pyrojet torch print heads. Um, on the other hand, if you use purely gaseous fuels, which means you have to have high pressure gas or uh, on-demand generation of oxyhydrogen, um, the situation is a little different in that, yes, you can get reliable combustions and detonations, but the 
gases themselves have to come from a high pressure source, which tend to be expensive, dangerous, and not all that favorable for keeping in a home shop. Um, and they leak quite a lot. It's difficult to manage them uh, at the flow rates required to be able to get high uh, cycle frequencies in the, in the printhead. Uh, and there's a few other issues with those processes. They, um, you know, in addition to all that, feeding material into the processes and reliably maintaining the material in the suspension or solution or in a fluidized bed, uh, along with the fuel or the, the gaseous fuels and oxidizers or the liquid fuels and oxidizers, makes the system even more complex and even harder to manage and harder to get a real read on, close the loop in terms of sensing and control. So, uh, just for all those reasons and uh, my personal mental sanity, mental health, uh, I've moved to something a little simpler that's actually already showing results in terms of printing metals like aluminum and copper with uh, pretty good conductivity, electrical conductivity values, and good potential for perhaps building thickness. Uh, I'm still working on that, but the situation has significantly improved in that we're able to lay down lines and even areas of metal on surfaces that's very strongly adhered. Um, and does it come off with, say, duct tape? You can p place a piece of duct tape on top of it and rip the duct tape off, duct tape off, and the metal does not come with the duct tape. Um, it's called a pull-off test. The um, so yeah, the the situation with this friction stir added manufacturing approach seems to be much easier to broach uh, for the performance we're looking for. Um, and it doesn't require nearly the management of as many complex process variables. It doesn't require handling any flammable liquids or gases at high pressures or otherwise. Um, and uh, it's relatively simpler to understand and to control uh, because it is basically just a slightly modified CNC machine with material feeding into the head instead of using a cutting bit to remove material. So it's kind of interesting. It's very exciting. And I, I'm gonna, I've been working on uh, several different variations. Uh, so far, the one I've had the most success with for getting fine line widths comparable to the lines you see on an FDM printer and for uh, getting good reliability and sort of long tool wear life without changes in shape of the tool has been using the diamond back nozzle, uh, the polycrystalline diamond nozzle from Champion X. You can buy on Amazon for about $100. Um, I'm using a one millimeter nozzle, but I've also used 0.4 and 0.8 nozzles. Um, and all of them seem to work okay. The smaller you go, the more likely they are to jam and clog, but uh, they, they, do, they do the job as a tool. Tungsten carbide and tungsten alloy nozzles also seem to work pretty well, and they are a much cheaper, cheaper alternative than uh, the polycrystalline diamond, roughly a third or half the price, respectively. So, um, of course, there's problems, or at least one big problem that I need to overcome, or that we need to overcome. Um, the feeding of material into the rotating spindle, into the rotating shaft, uh, is challenging. Getting a powder to flow reliably requires fluidization or some kind of a screw conveyor or something along those lines. Uh, just some way of forcing a sand-like material into a small hole and getting it to flow reliably out of the end of that small hole and into a extruding into the space underneath the nozzle's tool tip uh, has proven to be challenging. But it's significantly less so than trying to get powders to stay suspended in uh, flammable, reliably combustible or detonable liquid or gaseous mixtures, I find. Still, it, it poses an issue and it does you know, naturally, metal powders, motor bearings, and metal powders and electronics don't mix very well. So we've gone through several iterations of motors um, drilled and tapped to M6 on their ends uh, when the bearings inevitably fail due to powder clogging or they uh, short out because of metal powder getting in their electronic components. 
So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to show you the setup I've got right now and some of the things I'm trying, and hopefully uh, you can, ho hopefully if you feel like it, you can leave me some good suggestions in the comments below about what I should be doing, because uh, I'm kind of running out of ideas. Uh, so thanks a lot, and I'm going to turn us around and go take a look at our setup. Down here that I've got some metal lines drawn on this aluminum oxide substrate, the white aluminum oxide substrate right here. And beyond that, you can see, if I bring you down to the height that we need to be at, um, that the nozzle right here is, uh, it's got a brown or a gray tip on it. That tip is the polycrystalline diamond insert that goes in the nozzle. The body of the nozzle is brass. And what I've done is I've ordered a hollow shafted DC motor from Amazon. You can pick these up for probably $10, $12. And I have drilled and tapped the shaft from an, a four millimeter hole to a uh, six millimeter, to, well, sorry, an M6 threaded hole. And I've done that on both the bottom, well, I guess the, yeah, the nozzle end, and the top side where the hopper fits. Okay, and so if you look up here, this black plastic object is a 3D printed PLA metal powder hopper with a three and a half millimeter high speed steel drill bit that is. Uh, 150 millimeters long, sticking out of the top. And essentially what is going on here is, I don't know if you can see that very well. Um, yeah, this drill bit is supposed to act as a screw auger. So whenever the shaft turns, uh, ideally powder that falls down into the shaft from the vibration of the motor will get caught up against this screw as it's rotating with the inside of the shaft and that process will drive, or I was hoping, would drive the powder down into the nozzle and sort of press it out of the hole of the nozzle down at the very end down here. And that would allow me to extrude it reliably and to drive over it to fuse the powder to the underlying surface or to the previously deposited layer of material. And uh, that doesn't seem to be working, at least not very reliably. Uh, I think maybe the auger itself needs to be driven, or um, maybe we need some sort of fluidized bed, basically using compressed air at low pressure to blow the powder around and down into the shaft. Um, but this system that you're looking at right now is actually broken. Uh, the powder fell down into the motor bearing because of the way that the back of the, the hopper is designed. And I'm going to show you one up close here. Um, this just fits around the raised portion of the back of the motor and this ring is glued on the inside to the little hump in the back of the motor. What we have is this end goes, well it's supposed to go right over this end. And sometimes it fits, sometimes it doesn't. But yeah, you can see where the last one was, I broke it off, but basically it fits around this hump. And you can see the motor shaft and hollow shaft and bearing right there in the middle. And this uh, is where the powder goes in, into this hole. And uh, there's a bit of a bearing exposed around the shaft, unfortunately. And I'm just not too sure how to exclude powder. I guess I could put like a ring or something to plug that and prevent powder falling down into it or something. Or maybe design this a little more wisely so that it doesn't uh, allow material into this void that's formed here. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I'm still still kind of, uh, still fighting with it, as it were. Um, but yeah, so this is basically, what you're looking at is a Genmitsu 3018 Pro, uh, CNC router, mini CNC router. You can get it for about 200 bucks on Amazon. Uh, DC motor, also from Amazon. And uh, hollow shafted with a, with a four millimeter hole and a, a polycrystalline diamond nozzle. So the, the total like system setup cost, the total cost of this system is probably still less than $500. And so far we've actually had pretty good success printing uh, aluminum on aluminum oxide with it. Let me grab a sample, this is pretty dirty, but let me get up close. Yeah, I can print some lines of aluminum oxide on it and things like that. And uh, maybe I can get you close enough that you can see it. I don't know. Mm, yeah, maybe. Yeah, copper and aluminum oxide and a little bit of iron oxide as well from some steel powder, iron powder we've got laying around. So, 
copper and aluminum metal on aluminum oxide as well as iron oxide on aluminum oxide. So yeah, it's kind of interesting that we can we can do that at all. The um, but yeah, I'm I'm, I'm kind of I'm sort of out of ideas here. So uh, basically, that's where we're at. We're fighting with what we're calling Rotoforge or Autoforge. We're still deciding on what we're going to call it. Uh, basically, an evolution of the Pyrojet project. Where we're at with the Rotoforge, Autoforge project, Pyrojet project. Um, sort of the latest offshoot of Pyrojet, I suppose. Just trying to get some results and get more reliable material to position so that we can reliably build up 3D thickness in metals, ceramics, plastics, what have you, in a system that's relatively cheap and affordable and made entirely of commercial off-the-shelf parts. Um, so basically, one of the big benefits of this system is that we eliminate the unobtainium silicon carbide filament from the original sort of Pyrojet design. Uh, we greatly simplify a lot of the process physics and remove some of the need for complicated combustion chemistry and suspension or solution chemistry for maintaining fuel stocks and maintaining material in flammable fuel stocks uh, and get rid of the need to store combustible liquids and gases and things like that. So it's just a little safer, uh, it's easier to handle, easier to set up, easier to get all the parts for. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, if you've got any comments, suggestions, or pieces of wisdom or advice to share, uh, criticisms or whatever, uh, just leave them in the comment section below or yeah, come join our Discord. And I'm pretty much always online and I'm always happy to, to listen to new ideas and uh, new ways of doing things. Uh, so yeah, thanks a lot for listening if you've stuck with me this far and uh, hopefully I have something more productive to show you. Uh, hopefully we can have something working here. And, in relatively short order because I'm, I for one am excited and a little anxious to actually start printing real 3D metal parts at home on my desktop um, with good quality. Uh, which is, uh, I'll also link some papers and a book down in the description that would be good to read for those of you who are interested in the very deep technical details. Uh, so there are some unique features of this process that no other added manufacturing technique really uh, provides. Particularly that the printed material as printed uh, has properties that are comparable or better to the bulk material uh, of whatever the powder or the feedstock is made of. Uh, the process is a lot like, literally, like forging. It, um, it refines the grain structure of the material, uh, sort of removes porosity and uh, removes oxide inclusions through the, uh, the simple act of uh, plastic deformation at, at temperatures below the melting point of the material. For metals, at least, uh, that may not be so true for things like engineering plastics, like PEAK or HDPE. But I have some plastic materials that I intend to try, so we'll, we'll see what happens when we run those experiments. Um, anyways, thanks again. Uh, that's all I've got this time, and uh, I'll hopefully be making these a bit more regularly. Uh, it's been a busy life in the last couple of weeks. so Thanks a lot for sticking with us. This is Michael. Uh, I'll see you later.